Good morning and welcome to Southern Remedy. This is Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And this is your Southern Remedy program where we answer any and all questions related to your health care. That's right. It's anything that you've been thinking about, maybe a new symptom, <clears throat> maybe a medication and a Maybe a question, question or two about how it works, maybe some potential side effects, or maybe it's just uh, something that you got on your mind about how to have the best care for yourself or someone that's uh, near and dear to you. We always welcome emails. You can email any kind of question you might have to remedy at mpbonline.org. Also check out our podcast if you're not able to listen to the entirety of the show live, um, although that's the best way to do it, in my opinion. Um, you can always access that through your favorite podcasting app. Just look for Southern Remedy on MPB uh, Think Radio. Hope everybody's having a great week. Um, wonderful early summer weather out there, although I think we're starting to see some of the uh, unusual patterns that were brought by a lot of the uh, heat from last summer and a lot of the damage to trees. And uh, unfortunately, that's been coupled with a lot of straight line winds and uh, tornadoes and other other types of usual weather that we're having. So that's uh, sort of uh, uh, accelerates all the damage. So uh, just be careful out there and, and uh, particularly in, in bad weather conditions. But do take the time to improve your health. And that means getting active. It's recommended that most everybody, unless you have some health limitations, get uh, at least 30 minutes, uh, optimally uh, an hour of cumulative physical activity a day. Now, that can be brisk walking. That can be organized sports activities. It can be like pickleball. I guess that would be our, our newest one. Kevin Farrell's putting up a big X against that. Kevin Farrell is a is an avid, I would say, tennis player. So uh, I, that's that's what I usually get. Like, pe- you know, people who've been playing tennis for a long period of time, they're like, eh, pickleball. Nah, don't do that. So uh, whatever your sports activity um, <clears throat> and, or doing something, just uh, getting together with some people and just doing something active, that's a great way to improve your health. Again, at least 30 minutes a day would be great to get um, about an hour uh, most days of the week. So at least 150 minutes where you're doing something uh, to the extent where you get a little winded, but you can still talk and complete sentences, um, anything at least to that amount, uh, certainly short burst of increased physical activity after that. Again, as long as you're able to do that is uh, always great for your health. And then combining that with a reasonable um, um, diet that includes things that are healthy for you, certainly a lot of fruits and vegetables, a lot of uh, a limited amount of processed foods, limited amount of salt. That, those are all things that can keep you healthy. Most people think about length of time with that too. So it's not just length of time, it's quality of your life. So it's not the length of it all, all together. All those, those, those things that I just mentioned can certainly do that. But um, they can also um, ensure that you have a healthier lifestyle or at least increase your risk of having a, a he- healthier lifestyle as you grow older. Uh, but you got to keep doing them. Uh, they lose their uh, therapeutic effect, just like if you stop taking a blood pressure medication, your blood pressure is probably going to go up. If you stop uh, eating healthy and uh, exercising, really the effects uh, go away in about two to four weeks. So uh, if if you're uh, depends on age too. Certainly, as we get older, they go away. A little bit quicker. So just think about those things. Think about some small ways you could do that. I think most people are aware of maybe parking a couple of more spots away from the grocery store. Maybe uh, probably the time you spend going around and around the parking lot trying to find the pole position, as they say, in racing uh, closest to the store uh, is probably the same amount of time it would take for you to walk a little bit further. Uh, and again, I know there may be some limitations um, if based on your chronic medical conditions, um, but uh, talk to your physician about that beforehand if you have any questions about anything that might limit you. But, um, but that's certainly something that just about everybody can, can, uh, can engage in. All right, we're going to go to our first caller now, Hope from Laurel. Good morning, Hope. Hi, how are you? Good. Thanks for calling. Okay, so here's my question. The GLP-1 drugs, yeah. the ones that come from the manufacturer are completely different than the ones they're manufacturing in a pharmacy. Can you tell me the reason we can't have them in Mississippi? What's wrong with the ones coming from the pharmacy? 
the ones that are directly uh, formulated in the pharmacy itself. Is that what you're yeah. talking about? Yeah. It, it's not yeah. as standardized. That's the biggest thing. Uh, it's just, it's not as standardized a process. And, you know, a lot of that has to do with the delivery mechanism of those. Um, and particularly the GLP ones uh, with injectables, uh, you run the risk of contamination and there's less, there's more, you know, if you're having it from one manufacturer, certainly there are lots of standardization of safety things that go on that are required that they go through in the manufacture of it. And then also, if you find something, you can sort of cut that process off so you can figure out, okay, what was contaminated. But that's the biggest things. It's this lack of standardization and then um, a safety issue with with um, contamination of other things like bacteria in the in the um, process of making those. It is a it okay, is a, so it, have, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Any of, yeah, any of us that want to actually order it online, we're really running a high risk of getting sick. A higher risk, yeah, I would say it's it's just not. <clears throat> I know I know the issues. You know, a lot of people are benefiting from these, and we've got a lot of good data uh, out to four years now that they're very effective in you know both from a weight loss standpoint and a diabetic standpoint in treating those two conditions. They're also very protective against future um, heart uh, related uh, comorbidities, so things like heart attack. Um, so they're very effective, and that's one of the reasons why we now have about one in eight Americans that are taking one of these classes of drugs for various things. Is there abuse of that in some ways? Yeah, probably in, in some small – I think that's another reason why a lot of people are trying to go outside the system. But if you can imagine, that's, you know, that's close to 20 million people. The last I looked, that's, that's a rough estimate. Don't quote me on that completely, but that's a large number of people – that are, you know, if you think about the doses of these with just one, even once a week dosing, it's still a lot of drug that needs to be manufactured. So I get it. And I, I've had patients that we've struggled with prior authorization from an insurance standpoint and the cost of it. And uh, they are very effective medications. It's just like, as with any medication, you do run a risk if you get it online or if you get it outside the country. Um, you know, a lot of other uh, medications that people want. I'll use sildenafil or Viagra as a as an example too. You know, sure you can get it through Canada or other other means, but you always run the risk of those two things. Is your are you getting what you're paying for with the dose, and then is there going to be a problem with contamination that's not regulated through the other channels? So it is a risk that you take. Okay, that was my question. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for uh, listening. Thank you for calling. Let's go to William from Petal. Good morning, William. All right, Doctor Jimmy. I'm going to ask you about a subject nobody wants to hear. Okay. Talk about. All right. Shoot. All right. And uh, I, I'm afraid everybody in the world can recognize my voice. I'm <laughs> the only one like this. <laughs> So they're going to be laughing at me for quite a while. That's okay. If it's if it's like anything in medicine, if we're all honest, um, a lot of these things that we don't like to talk about yeah. are a lot more common. We just don't talk about it. Well, I've been a <clears> long time. I used to listen to Rick DeShazo. Yeah. All the time. You took over for him. He used to have a Volkswagen. He had a tag on the front when he was going to college. It said, eat more possum. <laughs> Definitely would want that on the front of your car, right? Yeah. I even sent him a license plate like that. <laughs> it's just been long, a few years back. But anyway, this is what I'm calling about. All right. All right. Hemorrhoids. Yeah, yeah. You know, they interfere with you cleaning yourself, you know, if they're exposed. Right. And also, it's a problem. It causes diarrhea and other stuff. And about 25 years ago, I had a surgery in that area, Mm -hmm. and they cut the sphincter muscle, the ring. Yeah. There's two rings that's supposed to help your uh, keep close up your anus. Right. And anyway, they cut them and left them gapped open. As you get older, you start losing. The uh, the pressure to do, to do what they were designed to do. Right, exactly. And so when you get hemorrhoids it, 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 that are there, they don't you, you can't uh, 
you have a problem fishing off the process. Right. All right, so I, I had a referral to go to um, Osher in New Orleans, but I don't like the idea of going down there. Okay. Is there anybody in Jackson that could do this hemorrhoid surgery and reconnect the, the sphincter uh, ring that goes around there? Yeah, the hemorrhoid surgeries should be fairly straightforward by either a general surgeon or even a gastroenterologist. And we've got a lot, <clears throat> you know, used to, they just go in and sort of cut them out or band them. But there's a lot of other ways we can do that now. Sometimes they're able, depending on the size and where they are, they can inject them with things and they it sort of cuts off the blood supply. Uh, a hemorrhoid is just a connection of, it's a dilation of those veins around the anus and some of them are, there's two sections. There's an internal hemorrhoid and then external hemorrhoids, depending on where they are in relationship to the anus. And um, you're right. There's a lot of things that can contribute to that. So if you bear down really hard when you have a bowel movement or you have a lot of recurrent either diarrhea or constipation, that can put you at an increased risk uh, for having those. And if you catch them early enough, you can do some of those things in the office or even do some things like the, the tucks or the uh, topical um, steroids that you can put on there, which takes a lot of time. I mean, we're talking weeks to, to uh, sort of uh, make them go away. But if they're really big and they're bleeding or if you have abnormal, you know, if you're hooked up abnormally like you are from the surgery, then, you know, the hemorrhoids are one issue, but then the anal reconstruction is another one. And I think... You know, there's probably somebody, I don't know anybody off the top of my head in Mississippi that might do that, but it's probably going to be a, um, a gastrointestinal surgeon or a, an abdominal surgeon that can do that. Or um, uh, a GI doctor is probably not going to be the person to go to for that part of it. But as far as, you know, taking care of the hemorrhoid problem, I think it can either be particularly if they're external, and by external I mean the stalk where they come from is outside the anus or the anal opening. If you can see it right there, that should be a GI issue that they can take care of. Uh, again, they do a lot more stuff internally now, though, and they have a lot more things to do it with. They're a lot safer and don't have the, you know, the post-operative complications. Um, so I would, I would get them to look at me. But then the other part is, you know, that's going to be a little bit more complicated. And I would guess <clears throat> if you have any kind of reconstruction, then, you know, they may want to sequence it. They may not want to do everything at the same time. Um, you may find a surgeon that can do all that and is like, yeah, we'll just take care of the hemorrhoids and we'll reconstruct you all at the same time. Or they may say, hey, you need to have those hemorrhoids taken care of first, and then once we get all that healed up, then we can talk about the reconstruction. But um, I don't know of anybody. If we have enough time to – if I find something during the break, I will um, throw that back out there um, to, uh, you know, just a, a couple of people that might be able to do that. But I understand your hesitation with going out of state and, and going down to New Orleans. Sometimes regionally, though, they have people that do – a great job of doing that, and they can work with with different insurances if it's not available in the state. But uh, let me do a little bit of digging and see what I can come up with. All right, Doctor Jimmy, uh, thank you. Hattiesburg uh, Clinic should be able to do this. Yeah, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so, and they're probably going to be able to give you like, hey, we think this person is the best person to do the reconstruction. But the hemorrhoids, yeah, hands down, they can take care of that. Oh yeah, but this is what. They said they didn't have nobody that specialized in reconstruction. And they said that the best thing to do is to go to Oscars. And they made me an appointment that's supposed to be good for a year. But uh, I just don't I, – I used to live down there. Yeah. And I just don't like it. And they said that you could come down there and they can do it. And then you in a couple of hours they put you out on the road and go home. But what hmm. if you got problems? Yeah, that's a long way. I agree. So, uh, Jackson would be a more direct route and and that kind of stuff. Yeah, let, let me check on that, and I'll throw that back out there. If you're not able to listen to the rest of the program, go to the archive or the podcast and just sit, you know listen to that. But I'll try to do some digging in, in the breaks and see if I can come up with something for you. All right, one more thing, Dr. Jimmy. Okay. Right quick. My wife is supposed to email it this at... Uh, remedy at mpbonline.org 
to you. That's perfect. And actually, if you will say, hey, this is William or, or this is William's wife, then uh, with the hemorrhoid issue and the anal reconstruction, I will email you directly. That's even a better way. That'll give me some time to, to research oh, yeah. that. All right, Dr. Jimmy, uh, thanks you, and I apologize for talking about such a gross subject. No, lots of people got this problem, so don't worry about that, William. This is Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning, answering your calls about any kind of health care topic that you might be interested in. Let's go to Ronnie from Corinth. Good morning, Ronnie. Hey, Dr. Jimmy. Thank you for taking my call. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, 66 years old, male, of course, and uh, suffering from some phantom pain in my right side. <clears throat> More towards the front, about the top of my hip bone. Uh, previous health issues, I had a hernia surgery on that lower right side in 2015. I'm a heart patient. But I've been through a number of different doctors, procedures. I've had CT scans with and without. I've had a colonoscopy. Uh, no problems with any of that. Nothing was found. Uh, I've had a bladder scope. Uh, prescribed flow mats, which didn't seem to help with that problem. Um, I'm currently on uh, amitriptyline. Mm-hmm. Amitriptyline, yep. Does not seem to help at all. And I'm kind of wondering what the next step is that I should take. Where should I go? What should I look for? So, uh, so just so I'm understanding, so you had the hernia surgery, the pain wasn't there beforehand, and then after you had that, it showed, it started showing up? Yes, the, the surgery was in 2015, and this pain started about a year ago. I actually thought it might be for kidney stone. Gotcha. But it keeps getting a little bit out. Yeah. Well, it sounds like they, yeah, it sounds like they've ruled out a lot of different things. You know, we, t- we typically, abdominal or side pain can sometimes be tricky because the nerves... It's not just what is directly underneath that. Sometimes it's things that are a little bit further away, but it, it feels like it's coming from that area. We call that referred pain. Uh, but it does it does sound like they've done all the imaging studies and other studies to try to figure out if it's any of those organs around that. Um, and you, some of those medicines you mentioned, like the, particularly the amitriptyline, is usually for chronic pain. Um Bladder bladder dysfunction sometimes can give you that, but that's usually sort of a different type of pain. It sort of comes and goes as your bladder gets distended. Um, <clears throat> I I might pain, oh go ahead. I'm sorry, let me mention this pain is kind of like a burning spasming pain. It can mm-hmm. be zero, it can be a one or a two, it can crank up to you know six or seven, but it's a spasm type pain. It kind of, grabs you, then it'll let go a little bit. And you never had, like, a, a rash around that area that you're having the pain? Nothing like that, no. Okay. Yeah, I I might try um, – have you been to a pain clinic, to a pain I specialist? Not, I, prob- I probably would do that as a next step. And they may not be able to localize where to do it, but they could, there's some other things that they can sometimes do – um, what about a transdermal lidocaine patch? Have you tried that, like a patch that goes over the same area? No, I have not tried Okay. That. So there are some other things they could try. They do want to be, you know, there are some things that they'll just have to keep in mind with your heart status. But um, there's there's a couple other things, and they're probably the right people at this point, even if it's not totally identified about what it is. It would be a little... Um, You know, you can do, particularly with a traditional surgical um, approach for inguinal hernia repair, you can do some damage to the nerves around the area, and that can be manifest in some ways. You can have a little entrapment of those nerves. Um, If... If it's if further surgery is not really a an a a an option for you, pain management sometimes if they can isolate the nerve where this is coming from, they can inject it and sort of just numb that that nerve, and um, that can be great from a pain because you won't feel the pain. It might be a little area of numbness in that area, but that hey, that's better than you know having the constant pain. But I think I, that would be my next step. You're probably going to need a referral from your physician, but I would just say, hey, can I see a pain specialist for this? And 
I think they're going to have a number of things that they could offer you. Okay, that's wonderful. That's what my question really was. What's the next step? So that's what we'll try. Got it. Very good. Well, thank you for taking my call. Yes, sir. Thank you, Ronnie. We appreciate you uh, listening and calling. All right, so Dr. Jimmy, while we wait for the next call to come in, I thought I would use my executive privilege and ask a question. And that is, uh, as you mentioned, I like to play tennis. I was played last night. I went to the tennis drills and felt a little bit worn out. And um, I didn't get a cramp because sometimes when you feel a cramp coming on, you can avoid it cramping up. But anyway, my question is, what exactly is a muscle cramp and what causes it? Yeah, uh, that's a very common thing um, that can happen. So it's usually uh, associated with muscle fatigue in some kind of way. So our muscles, it's not just one big muscle. It's a combination of little bitty fibers. And each one of those fibers contracts. And it really has to do with the total uh, movement of your of your muscles. So if you think of like your biceps uh, in your upper arm, you know, it contracts to move your hand closer to your shoulder. And um, you can contract some of those fibers and it'll just contract a little bit or you can contract a lot of fibers and the whole muscle contracts. But they're all packed in these little bundles and they uh, allow us, by having multiple ones like that, you can have very fine slow motion or you can have really quick big motion. So it allows us a range of motion. Otherwise, we'd just be sort of spastically just, you know, doing stuff. You wouldn't be able to play tennis. So <clears throat> over time, though, they can become fatigued. And the way those muscles work is they receive impulses through nerves that attach to the muscles uh, in different places, and they give it that signal to contract. And when they do that, there are neurotransmitters that uh, are released at that junction that tell the muscle fiber, hey, I just came from this nerve, it says contract. Um, and then that happens, but in order for the muscle to do that, it has to rely on certain things being in the fluid around it, around those muscle cells. And calcium is one of those, magnesium is one of those, potassium is one of those. And you need continual amounts of those, otherwise they get used up. And then the muscle can become either contracted, um, like you may have you know, noted this, like if you get really tired, uh, a muscle isn't able to relax because some of those electrolytes are involved not in the contraction phase, but the relaxation phase. And I, a lot of people have had, you know, sort of that muscle twitch after you've, you know, had a tournament or after you've been doing a lot of things, looking at a computer screen, you might even have that on your eyelid. That's a fatigued muscle that is in spasm. So it's spasming. It's not a coordinated uh, contraction of those muscles. And then sometimes you can have it where you really get a true muscle cramp where they really, they contract and they don't ever relax. And there are some things that can put you more at risk for that. Um, some of those electrolyte disturbances, particularly if you're out doing things for prolonged periods of time and you're dehydrated, you're not getting enough electrolytes in your system, then that, that can put you at risk for doing that. Or it could be a medication you're taking or something else that predisposes you to have it. So people who tend to have lower potassium um, levels uh, chronically, they're going to be more prone to, to have muscle cramps. Magnesium is another one. But that doesn't mean you just go out and take potassium or magnesium. If your levels are fine, if the doc, you know, if this is a repetitive problem and then you go in and you get your electrolytes checked and they're fine, there's not really a need to take a supplement. But hydration's the other part of this. And it's not just how you how hydrated you are and how you feel. Like it's not okay, well, I'm not sweating, I shouldn't drink. Depending on your muscle use. At the muscle level, it may be dehydrated, but the rest of your body and other areas may not. So, you know, your body does a pretty good job of distributing water through all its different tissues. But if you're using those tissues more in certain areas, you might need a little bit more hydration during those times than you think. And uh, most of the time, just drinking water, particularly if it's less than a 45-minute activity, if it's longer than 45 minutes, you may need some electrolytes. But um, if you got a good diet beforehand and, you know, 45 minutes, it's probably good, whatever activity you're doing, just to drink water. Um, but those are the main causes of it. Now, we do have other problems that, you know, and, and, and by the way, muscles that aren't used to activity are more prone to spasm or cramp. So if you're the weekend warrior going out there and you hadn't done it in a while, 
you know, that's your, you, yeah, you're going to be the guy that gets the stitch in the side or like is, you know, pulls a muscle or something like that. That's, that's all sort of the vernacular of the same thing happening in those muscles. And it can be very, it, it's amazing, like how much pain they can cause. Um, sometimes general stretching afterwards can help with that, particularly if you can isolate where you're having that cramp. Um, and, you know, you'll see this happen all the time in sports when somebody gets a cramp um, later in the game, it's hot, and they go out and sort of stretch it out and then sort of work it back out. It's fine. Um but um, but paying attention to hydration is probably the biggest thing I would say. If it is repetitive, though, go to your doctor because they may there may be some other things that are going on with that. Um, there are other neuromuscular problems that are very very rare, but they can pop up in kids. They can pop up in adults sometimes. I have a few patients with some uh, acquired neuromuscular problems over time as they've gotten older. Uh, that cause a lot of problems. And there are some good therapies depending on what the what the issue is. So it is nice to see somebody just to sort of say, okay, I'm not seeing any warning signs or red flags that this might be something that's not just, you know, your, your run-of-the-mill muscle cramp. So that's Kevin Farrell, our producer, always good with a very excellent question. So uh, thanks, thanks to him for doing that and the hundreds of other things he does to keep me in line. Again, I mentioned at the top of the hour, you know, just what great weather we're having and great opportunities to get out there. And don't forget, too, like you may have some memory of this. I see people are sort of uh, depressed, that, and myself included. Uh, I went for a run last night when I got home, just a short one, and for me at least. And um, it's um, it's amazing, like, you know, if you haven't been doing things for a while and you get sort of depressed when you get back out there and you're like, oh, my goodness, particularly when the humidity hits the south, it's like a wall hits you in the face. And I've seen a lot of people just give up at that point and say, oh, I'm just not doing anything. This is not worth it. If you really push through that and uh, ease into it, don't expect to um, jump back in at the same level that whenever you last did that. Um, cause it does take a little bit of time to, um, acclimatize yourself to, to being able to do those kinds of things. You, you'll feel a lot better in about two weeks after you sort of ease back into it. Good morning, Aiden. Good morning. How are you? Good. What's your question this morning? Well, I was, uh, I had a question and questions and concern regarding arthritis and inflammation, joint inflammation, which is just eat me alive. Okay. So I was wondering, you know, you see the Omega XL and stuff on TV. I don't know what works and what doesn't work. So I was kind of get one to get some insight on what would be effective and what do I need to, um, you know, plan action to get, you know, some help. Yeah. Now, let me ask a couple of questions. Do you know what type of arthritis this is? Has somebody looked at it and said, yeah, we think this is osteoarthritis or wear and tear arthritis, or is it a different type of arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis? Okay. It, it's uh, rheumatoid and wear and tear arthritis. <laughs> Both of them. Okay. That's common too. Yeah. So that is important because the way we treat it is a little bit different. Now, for any type of arthritis, arthritis just means inflammation of the joints. And uh, those joint surfaces rub up against each other. They've got what's called a synovium, uh, which is this slick surface to help them move. Uh, everywhere where you have a bone on a bone, that's that's a joint, okay? And that any of those joints can become inflamed. Um, there can be inflammation where you have some cells move in, Um uh, you know, one of the one of the causes of this, if you think about it, if you, you know, sometimes people have viral infections, whether it's a summer cold or the flu or something like that, and they'll they'll say my bones ache or my joints ache. And that's what's happening is you've got those little immune deposits that are around those joints and you've got some inflammation there. Once you clear the infection, it usually goes away. Now, um, the osteoarthritis is the wear and tear arthritis. So that's joints that we use over and over again. If they become damaged, um, like a, a knee, uh, you know, an old football injury or another injury, like maybe you tore your ACL and didn't get it repaired in time, and you damage that articular surface between the two bones in your knee, then over time that can wear down. And when you lose that 
that cartilage uh, that helps protect the ends of the bones, and it's pretty much bone on bone at that point, and it just that's what causes a lot of the pain. So uh, as we get older, almost all of us will develop some parts or some partial uh, osteoarthritis, and there's common joints like your thumb and your dominant hand that you use, and uh, I, I, you know, I often wonder, like, as, as many people are using iPhones and things like that, we're probably going to have a lot more of that moving forward. Uh, but, you know, it's any joint you can see that. It might be a misalignment of joints over time, like in your spine. Uh, it might be an overuse of those over time. Then that's osteoarthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is in the uh, other category of truly inflammatory conditions, and it's an autoimmune disease where your body is producing substances that are actively uh, causing inflammation in multiple joints, and um, that can cause an erosive arthritis to that articular surface. Now, with both of these, you can take things like ibuprofen, Tylenol, um, you know, those kinds of medications that can help with the pain and sometimes with the inflammation, uh, but that's really not treating the underlying process if you have right. if you have rheumatoid arthritis, there are disease modulating drugs now that you need to take to sort of cut that process off, and that's not something that's going to be over the counter. Um, uh, it's gotten very targeted. You know, we used to have only things like prednisone, which had a ton of side effects um, and caused thinning of the bones, which sort of accelerated the process of rheumatoid arthritis in some joints. Um, we've gotten much better at this at cutting that process off. Osteoarthritis, we don't have a, a way to cut the process off, but we do know that, that movement of the joints and strengthening of the muscles around the joints so you can take some of the pressure off those joints can help maintain function and decrease further, uh, further damage to those. So depending on where the joint is, your physical therapist is your friend, even though most people don't think of them in that way, at least not at first. Um, and then there's uh, lots of other things you can do for, for pain in specific joints like Voltaren gel, which you can get over the counter, which is sort of akin to ibuprofen, but it's uh, something that you put over the surface of the skin over the joint. Or I mentioned lidocaine patches, uh, you know, prior, sometimes that, that's appropriate. There's some other long-term medications you can take. Um, if the joint gets to the point where it is worn down, to the, you know, and there's just not, you've lost function in it, you're having a lot of pain, if it's something like the knee or hip uh, and you don't have a lot of other complications, then a joint replacement might be in order. And after they do that, you really don't have to worry, you know, from the side effect of, of rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis in that joint. And it really is just a, at, at that point, it's, it's sort of a judgment call about, okay, is it time? Uh, how much pain are you having? How much limited function are you having? So I would, uh, if you've got both of those, in my opinion, everybody with rheumatoid arthritis, even though I treat a lot of it up front, uh, should at least see a rheumatologist, you know, once or twice to, to, to confirm the diagnosis. Um, because again, it is totally different in the way that you treat that. And, um, you mentioned some of the over-the-counter things. Now, there are some things you see on TV that are treatment specifically for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, occasionally, I'll have a patient come in and say, hey, I need something for my rheumatoid arthritis, and I do my exam, I get some lab tests, and they don't really have what either somebody has told them is rheumatoid arthritis or maybe a misconception of that's what's going on. So that allows me to really focus on those other things that work for osteoarthritis. But if you've been told that or, or have a suspicion of it, I would at least have, you know, your physician do the testing and do the exam because it's a different pattern. It's a different exam for rheumatoid arthritis. That's done through blood work? You can get it... Uh, it's partially through blood work and, and other, there's a, it, the synovium, that um, thin tissue in the joint and that sort of uh, lines the joint is inflamed in, uh, in, in rheumatoid arthritis. So somebody who's skilled at, at feeling for that, and there's a pattern of it too, like you can get enlargement of the joint, say, in your hand. The ones that go along with osteoarthritis are the ones 
that are at the end, like they're in the middle of the fingers and at the end of the fingers, you'll get some, some inflammation there, uh, or, or not inflammation, you get some enlargement of the joints and you'll have pain. Rheumatoid arthritis tends to be more proximal, so it's your wrist and those uh, joints, uh, those first joints where your fingers connect to your hand. So there are some patterns sometimes that can do that. Uh, but yeah, there is, there's uh, some lab work that they can check for too that can identify if it's rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, another thing, and I don't know if it's directly related to the arthritis is so bad, but I get numbness and burning in my feet, and then they were saying that's more like neuropathy, but um, is that a different, a totally different? Yeah, it can well, it can be different. You know, a lot of people will have other conditions that can cause that. Like they'll have either a um, it, sometimes there's like a B12 deficiency or folate deficiency that can do that. Um, that that's a little bit more rare, and that's that's an easy one to test because again, that's a blood test they can test for. Um, it could be because of the the way the nerves are going through the joints that you're having that. If they're getting you know pushed on one way or another, that can cause some pain. That typically is not like all over. It's usually like one or two joints if that's the case. Um, and then you could have you could have something totally different. Like it could be an you know an associated thing. Sometimes diabetics have this. That's a very common complication of diabetes. Um, so it may not be totally related to that, but again, if you had rheumatoid arthritis, you could potentially turn that process off with a with a medication or a number of medications that you take on a regular basis and have a really dramatic improvement. So go to a room. Well, if, if the first thing I do is, would be to go to your regular doctor and see if they can maybe get the process started with some of those tests to say, hey, I, I'd like to know if I have rheumatoid arthritis versus osteoarthritis or wear and tear arthritis or both. And uh, sometimes they'll say, well, I'll just send you to a rheumatologist. We don't have a whole lot of rheumatologists in some areas of the state. I would guess where you are, it's probably going to be a bit of a drive to get get to somebody uh, that could see you. So there may be some things that they can do before you ha- before you go to that rheumatologist. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I just, you know, that you're, you don't know for sure, but I did have my blood work done, and they're saying, you're not diabetic, your blood work looks good. Um, it's just, um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and it, 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 it would depend, too. Like, some of these tests aren't things that we test on everybody. Um, so they may not have tested for them like that. You know, there's a, something called a, an ESR or a CRP. Uh, those two tests test for, for specifically for, for inflammation going on in the body. Um, they're, they, but they can, anything can be, you know, anytime you get an illness, they're going to be elevated a little bit, at least a little bit. There's also something called a rheumatoid factor. Uh, that is, an, again, a blood test that they can test for. Some people have, uh, there's, there's some other types of autoimmune tests, uh, blood tests that you can get um, depending on, you know, on, on what you're looking at. And some, and some labs have like a panel of that, but that wouldn't be something that, you know, just everybody going in for a yearly checkup would get like you would say for, you know, uh, uh, cholesterol once a year and, and that kind of thing. This is Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning and uh, answering lots of good questions about the health of uh, yourself or somebody else that's in your family. Uh, Just keep in mind, if you're not able to call today, that number, uh, sorry, that email address that you can email uh, your questions to is remedy at mpbonline.org. Uh, did get a question that's probably one that, um, <clears throat> that probably is best answered by Dr. Kinsey on, uh, on Fridays. But somebody asked me, you know, what's the best thing to do to stay healthy before you get pregnant and uh, for women? And uh, it really is very common to everything else we usually talk about, you know, with eating a healthy diet and exercise. Uh, if you have time to do that, uh, certainly you don't need to stop doing those kinds of things. Particularly for women, though, folate is something that if you're not getting a lot of, of green leafy vegetables, uh, having a, a multivitamin a day that has folate in it is very helpful to prevent 
uh, neural tube defects. That's or those are spinal defects in a developing baby, and those those kinds of things pop up early in pregnancy, and you really need enough folate even sometimes before you know you're pregnant. So that would be one thing that you might you know if you're if you're in that category that you might want to. Uh, might want to look into. The other thing I would say is calcium, and that's important for anybody uh, who's a woman of, of childbearing age to, t- to uh, take in enough calcium and vitamin D on a regular basis. And that can be, you know, it, people argue about which one's better, and you see lots of commercials, and really what it comes down to, it, it's, not, it's not any one better than the other, but at least anywhere from 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams a day plus uh, 400 units of vitamin D a day would be uh, best and again, that's to help you build up your bones so that you can grow that baby if you're getting pregnant. So that's always uh, something to think about as you um, as you prepare. It's always, and I know, you know, those kinds of things come up. You, you never sort of plan for that. But again, doing things to, to prevent any kind of complications and doing it in a state where you can actually do something about it is uh, very useful rather than waiting till you're in that position and being like, well, you know, now I'll get, I'll get sort of healthy now that I'm in this, in, uh, at this point. That being said, if you do have hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, it's never too late to do something about that. Um, I, you know, honestly, I don't have a lot of patients that have come off of medications completely, but I do have a few. Uh, it was usually early in their illness, but I've had some a little bit later that had dramatic changes in their diet and activity level and have been very successful in coming off uh, their medications or at least reducing the number that they're taking or the doses that they're taking as well. So don't think that just because you're taking, you know, four or five different medications for your hypertension, diabetes, or cholesterol that you're beyond the hope of ever doing anything to impact that. And even if you come off of one medication, hey, that's a win. You're doing better in what you can do yourself. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Southern Remedy is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio and is funded in part by a grant from the, from the University of Mississippi Medical Center. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, professor of internal medicine and pediatrics at UMMC. Southern Remedy is produced by Kevin Farrell. You can tune in to MPB Think Radio every weekday morning at 11 for the full Southern Remedy lineup.